Good morning, bonjour, buenos dias, sin chao, ni hao, what's up? It's me, Mr. Jordan. Today we are going to be looking at The Hammond's Tale by Margaret Atwood, chapter 23. So we will start with a brief recap and summary. Then we're going to move into a closer reading and do some line-by-line -line analysis of the text. And finally, we'll finish with vocabulary, including the context and definitions of those words. Chapter 23 starts with our narrator, Offred, having just returned from the birth of Angela, Janine's daughter. She's exhausted and goes to sleep. She has a dream of the past, as she often does. Then she's woken by Cora. Cora tells her she's excited and suggests that Offred too will become pregnant and maybe their household can have a new baby. Remember, this is an exciting, momentous occasion in Gilead. And finally, we're told that with Serena Joy still out of the house celebrating with the other wives the new birth, the commander has invited Offred to his room, to his private study. When she gets to that private study, she's expecting some sort of illicit sexual encounter. But what actually happens is that it's an office, a room full of forbidden books, and the commander reaches into his desk and he pulls out a game of Scrabble, and they play a game of Scrabble together, almost recreating like an adolescent or an innocent date. And then at the end of the date, he asks her to kiss him. And when she does, he reiterates that he wants her to kiss him, but this time as if she meant it. Let's get into some deeper analysis and do a closer line by line reading of the chapter. The chapter starts with a signal of what's to come. Offred tells us, quote, this is a reconstruction. All of it is a reconstruction. It's a reconstruction now in my head as I lie flat on my single bed, rehearsing what I should or shouldn't have said, what I should or shouldn't have done, how I should have played if I ever get out of here. So there's a bit of foreshadowing that they're gonna play the game of Scrabble, but it's also this larger real realization that life itself in Gilead is playing by a certain set of rules. And in order to succeed at what she wants to achieve her goal of escaping, Offred is starting to acknowledge that she's gonna to have to play by certain rules or play within the context of the game that has been created in Gilead's new system. There's also a hint here what this text is, so what the narrative we're reading is, and that it's something that Offred has created for a future reader or for someone who's gonna find this text and listen to it or read it, presumably in a world once again changed. So returning to the idea of the palimpsest, her audience is not someone who's participating in the current iteration of history in Gilead. It's a future reader. And she says, quote, if you happen to be a man sometime in the future and you've made it this far, please remember, you will never be subjected to the temptation of feeling you must forgive a man as a woman. It's difficult to resist, believe me. But remember that forgiveness too is a power. To beg for it is a power, and to withhold or bestow it is a power, perhaps the greatest. Maybe none of this is about control. Maybe it isn't really about who can own whom, who can do what to whom and get away with it, even as far as death. Maybe it isn't about who can sit down and who has to kneel or stand or lie. Legs spread open. Maybe it's about who can do what, to whom, and be forgiven it. Never tell me it amounts to this. What we're getting here is this fuller scope or understanding from Offred of the day-by-day -day quotidian rules and examples she has to follow and participate in and how she's, she's sort of starting to see outside of the box of Gilead, outside of the small rules that are being played. And this again hints at later in the chapter when they play Scrabble. And Scrabble is not accidentally chosen by Atwood. Scrabble is the playing of words, letters, right? So she's able to create narratives and to play with something that's forbidden. Words are forbidden to the handmaids, to women 
creating words, creating a narrative or a story, or as our Fred tells us, a reconstruction, is a forbidden act. It's outside of the rules and scope of Gilead. So by starting to play Scrabble, what they're really doing is pushing the boundaries of the law and playing with the limits of legality or the limits of control within Gilead. Before she enters the office, she tells us, my presence here is illegal. It's forbidden for us to be alone with commanders. We are for breeding purposes. And then later, we are two-legged wombs. That's all, sacred vessels, ambulatory chalices. And she wonders before she steps through the doorway, before she crosses that threshold into the forbidden space of the commander's office, what secrets, what male totems are kept in here? So it's this idea almost like she's entering a religious underworld or literally crossing over into a different plane. And inside, all around the walls, there are bookcases. They're filled with books, books and books and books, right out in plain view. No locks, no boxes. No wonder we can't come in here. It's an oasis of the forbidden. I try not to stare. So again, in context, this is following on the story of Moira's escape. And what Atwood is doing is, as a reader, she's starting to show us the wider possibilities outside of the small household scope that so far we've seen within Gilead. She's also giving hope to her protagonist, the narrator off red, and starting to create different possibilities. So right within the household, in the commander's office, there's this whole world of books and texts and other stories and narratives than the, the single solitary story she's been telling us. And also outside the household, there's now this possibility of Moira and of escape. Then speaking of Scrabble, she explicitly tells us now, of course, it's something different. It's forbidden for us. It's dangerous. It's indecent. It's something he can't do with his wife. Now it's desirable. Now he's compromised himself. It's as if he's offered me drugs, right? Mind-altering substances. Playing Scrabble for them and playing words is a mind-altering substance because it changes the limits of what's possible. All of this brainwashing and mind warping that's happened in the Leah and, Re and Rachel Center, where they were re-educating the handmaids, well, they were making them illiterate, right? They were teaching them to no longer function as thinking, intelligent human beings with choice and freedom to and power of will. And however small or subtle, Scrabble reintroduces those possibilities for her. All right, I say, as if indifferent, I can, in fact, hardly speak. He doesn't say why he wants to play Scrabble with me. I don't ask him. We play two games. Larynx, I spell. Valence. Quince. Zygote. So this interesting thing is happening with these words. This is the vocabulary of someone who's very well read, very intelligent. All of a sudden, off-read shifts from a brain warped or mind washed two legged womb, as she says, to reverting to this university educated uh, authorial character that is much closer in resemblance to the mind of Margaret Atwood and much less in resemblance to a starving, suffocating prisoner. In other words, she's starting to realize or enjoy power, some sort of freedom to choose. She jokes, this is like being on a date. This is like sneaking into the dorm after hours, almost like she's having fun. Then she returns, this is conspiracy. So there is still this pall of death or violent threat. Hanging. Then when the commander finally, before she leaves, asks her for a kiss, as if you meant it, this feeling of him, this is weakness. He's like a little schoolboy. He wants something. I want a nice kiss. I want you to like me. Eh. Right? It's almost as if he's begging her. He's definitely put himself in a position of weakness and proffered up some of the control or let it slip out of his grasp. And Offred now has some power or dominance over him. 
He was so sad, she says. But that is a reconstruction, too. In other words, the sadness or emotion she's attributing to him is her looking back from whatever current time she's creating this narrative. Now we're going to do a bit of vocabulary along with the context and definitions of the word from chapter 23. Reconstruction. The action or process of reconstructing or being reconstructed. A thing that has been rebuilt after being damaged or destroyed. An impression, model, or reenactment of a past event formed from the available evidence. So being rebuilt after destruction or destroyed, that's similar to the process that Alfred, the narrator, is going through in the chapter. Right? She's rebuilding these neural pathways that have been destroyed by playing Scrabble, by creating words. Even just by feeling that she has a little bit of power, it changes the way she thinks. It undoes some of the mind warping and brainwashing that's taken place. Nuance. So a nuance is a subtle difference or shade. Uh, it's a slight expression, sound, meaning, shift. Um, it also sort of has this connotation of something that's being a little complex or hard to understand. And that's because it comes from the French word for cloud, nubis, um, or nuel. And so you're getting this idea of the story, right? A kind of mist or cloud is coming up. It's less clear what situation Offred's actually in in this chapter. The boundaries are starting to get blurred. So concubine was in past societies a woman who lives with a man but has lower status than his wife or wives, especially in polygamous societies. An archaic meaning is also a mistress. So Alfred tells us specifically that handmaids were not concubines. But if you look at the definition, they're literally the explicit and exact definition of a concubine. So what's happening here? Well, it's irony or kind of dramatic irony where we're understanding that this character can't see outside of her own role or the brainwashing role it's been given her so she isn't completely lucid or understanding of her context yet and it comes from the French sort of coubeur, so to lie so literally to lie down so this theme again of lying and laying repeats itself Zygo this is one of the terms that's used in Scrabble, and it's, it's an offhanded thing, supposedly. But when we look it up, it's actually a clear reference to the story and context. So it comes from the word, the Greek word, meaning to be yoked. And in biology, it refers to literally a fertilized ovum. So it's the pregnancy before it becomes a baby, before the ovum takes shape as a actual living being creature. So there's definitely some foreshadowing here, or at least a reference to what else is going on in the chapter. Conspiracy. So a conspiracy is a secret plan by a group or person to do something unlawful or to commit a harmful act, plotting against the powers that be. And it comes from the French or the Latin to agree or to plot. And in this case, Offred says the Scrabble game itself is a conspiracy. And what she means is that the commander and herself are literally joining together to conspire against the laws of the land. Their secret is a secret that's withheld from Serena Joy, withheld from the other commanders, from the other people in the house, maybe even from Nick, although likely Nick knows and they're conspiring against the rules and the game playing structure of their society in Gilead. Thanks so much for watching. That was chapter 23. I hope you liked it. Um, ask any questions and comments below. Thanks so much for watching and I will see you next time in chapter 24 of The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood. Yeah.